to be or not to be. If music be the food of love, oh, for Play meals on. of fire. What must the king do now? Oh, that this too, too sullied flesh would tomorrow, melt. And tomorrow, and tomorrow, uneasy lies the head that wears a crown. I was first exposed to Shakespeare when I was in high school in Scotland and we got uh, Macbeth as part of our English course. And I was really, um, well, first of all, I was really amazed to read a play that was about all the places that I knew because, you know, it's about um, Burnham Wood, which is right next to Dunkirk where I was born, and Cawdor, where my parents were from, and Glam's is very near where I grew up. So it was this really weird thing. I, I had this great connection. And you know, it's all set in Scotland, it was a great ripping yarn, but I, I thought, I was really disappointed to read the next Shakespeare and find that it didn't all happen in my backyard. I've played um, Malcolm and Macbeth, was the first thing I ever did professionally at the Tron Theatre in Glasgow, directed by Michael Boyd, who then went on to run the Royal Shakespeare Company. And then I did, um, after that, I did Hamlet for the English Touring Theatre uh, and at the Dormer Warehouse. To be or not to be? That is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them. Then at the Royal Shakespeare Company I did Silvius and As You Like It. Then I did Romeo uh, in Romeo and Juliet at the National Theatre Studio. Then I did, I've done two films of Shakespeare. I did uh, uh, Saturninus and Titus and uh, um, Sebastian in the Tempest, both directed by Julie Taymor. And then I've also played um, all the parts in Macbeth <laughs> for the National Theatre of Scotland. If it were done when it is done, and twere well it were done quickly. If the assassination could trammel up the consequence and catch with his surcease success. Tomorrow, and tomorrow, and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. Some of the challenges I find are the fact that there's so many kind of, um, huge and multi-faceted thoughts and ideas uh, with lots of um, kind of little offshoots. So trying to give them the full value, each one the full value, and also uh, uh, being able to bring it back to the actual thrust of the sentence. That's really difficult. And it's, um, but it's, I think it's about just giving each one its due. You know, I think the thing with Shakespeare, he actually makes it easy for you. There's a rhythm through it. If you stick to the rhythm, you'll get it. And um, the language is so amazing and the things he has to say are so incredible, but it's, it, it's a lot, you know, he packs it in. If music be the food of love, play on. It's just, I mean, the biggest challenge, I suppose, is just hoping that you've done it well enough that everyone gets as much as they possibly can from it. Now is the winter of our discontent made glorious summer by this son of York. They're very different characters, these, all these royals. I mean, there's, you know, there's the more well-known, like the princes of uh, Hamlet, King Macbeth. Um, but then there's um, Prospero as well from The Tempest. Now my charms are all o'erthrown, and what strength I have's mine own, which is most faint. Now, tis true, I must be here confined by you or sent to Naples. Let me not, since I have my dukedom got and pardoned the deceiver, dwell in this bare island by your spell. But release me from my bands with the help of your good hands. There are some characters from royal plays that aren't 
technically royal, like the chorus from Henry V. Oh, for a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention, a kingdom for a stage, princes to act, and monarchs to behold the swelling scene. And then there's the bastard, so I suppose he's not really a royal. Mad world. Mad kings. Mad composition. I, I mean, I, I chose them all really because of just the range of emotions in them, the range of thoughts and the range of kind of uh, temperament and, and aesthetic, you know, just to get a really varied look at all these different men. And uh, I think it's really good. And also some of them are really kind of gung-ho and and uh, jingoistic, like with some of the Henry V ones. In peace, there's nothing so becomes a man as modest stillness and humility. But when the blast of war blows in our ears, then imitate the action of the tiger. There's a few that are really sappy and sucking up to Elizabeth I, um, which I thought was quite fun too. There's one about, you know, the one that um, Cranmer does from Henry VIII. It's like, hello, we get it. But uh, it, there's just, it's just a real cornucopia. Well, some of those parts I have played, and it was nice to go back to them. And some of them I would love to play. Some of them quite, and more so after having done this, actually. But uh, it's also nice to do parts that you'll never play, or even parts you don't really want to play, but they've got a good couple of speeches. <laughs> so uh, that, that was quite fun. And then, and you know, but after having played all the parts in Macbeth, including all the women, I don't see any barriers. In Shakespeare, I mean, initially all the all the parts were being played by men anyway when they were first performed. So I don't the sort of gender rules, and the, and the aging rules. I think Shakespeare, you know, what I love about I love seeing like a school production of Shakespeare where there's little, a little you know, fourteen year old playing Prospero or King Lear or something. That makes me very happy and makes me laugh a lot. So I, I think actually this is this is in the in the tradition of of the of telling the Shakespeare stories. To be or not to be, that is the question. <laughs>